The reading is Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, taken from the message. You're blessed. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed the hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You are blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God than his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You are blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you will ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when you commit You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out to speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when it, that happens. Give a cheer even, for though they do not like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brilliant. Oh, thank you so much, guys, for, for reading. That's great. And great to have uh, the message version sometimes as well. Right, as I walked in this morning, Steve Reed saw me with uh, these dots and he said, Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes. <laughs> so I'm just going to make sure they're in the right order. So we're talking about things being upside down this morning, aren't we? Talking about God turning our world upside down with His. Uh, with Jesus' teaching that was on uh, the um, Mount of Beatitudes. But this is a really cool part of the Bible, which we uh, need to go back almost to the beginning of the Bible in order to understand quite how cool this bit really is. So I wonder if you can go back in your mind to God's people who are slaves in Egypt. Can you remember that bit in the Exodus? God's people are slaves in Egypt. And uh, they are being um, oppressed. Um, and lots of them are dying at the hands of the Egyptians. There's quite a lot of bloodshed. We've got a nice big red spot here. Um, and God hears the cries of his people. And through Moses, their leader, who goes and petitions Pharaoh uh, day after day, God's people are released, aren't they? They um, are freed from slavery in Egypt, and they pass through the Red Sea, which is parted um, through uh, God's power. The waters are parted, and God's people go through the center, almost like uh, the center aisle here, and then they come out to the deserts, where they're dependent on God to give uh, them food and drink and nourishment. And whilst they're wandering in the desert, they're waiting for God to show them the promised land. 
the place where they will be safe. And God's kingdom and his rule and his reign will be established forever. And so before they get to the promised land, God gives them some rules to live by. The Ten Commandments. Okay? With that, we've come through, we've come through that story. So we've gone from the red to the blue to the yellow to the grey. Yeah, we've done that round. Okay? <laughs> So, when we get to Matthew's Gospel, little side note, Matthew is writing his account of Jesus' life to persuade the Jews, uh, God's people, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that they have been waiting for, who is going to bring God's rule and God's reign. So, right at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, we hear that Jesus, the Messiah, has been born as a baby in Bethlehem. But that Herod, the king, is out to kill him. And so, where do Mary and Joseph and Jesus run to? They run to Egypt to be safe from the bloodshed. They're safe there for a little while, and then eventually they go home to Nazareth, where Jesus grows up as Jesus, well that was, I didn't do the red, sorry that was confusing wasn't it? That was red. <laughs> they've, they've escaped from Egypt, everything is fine, back to Nazareth. Jesus grows up and is baptised and we get, don't we, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, I think it is, um, Jesus baptised and as he comes out of the water we hear the voice of God the Father this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. I love that bit because it feels like kind of like teenage slack, well pleased. <laughs> but I think actually, um, it's just a kind of, uh, it, it's supposed to just uh, show that God is so pleased with him, isn't it? Not, not the Lord using slack, sadly. Anyway, so here again, Matthew is, um, is showing that Jesus is God's Messiah. It's confirmed by the voice of God, of God over his son at Jesus' baptism. Immediately, and Mark is better at using immediately, but in Matthew as well, immediately Jesus is sent out to the desert where he's tempted by the devil to, um, to turn the rocks into bread to eat to jump from a really high tower, to be caught by the angels, to prove himself as God. But Jesus won't be tempted by the devil. In, instead, he just quotes scripture back at the devil. Do you remember my first uh, sermon here a couple of weeks ago? I encouraged us all to get into our Bibles, to start reading our Bibles again. It's so important that we know scripture so that when we go through difficult times, just like we've sung in uh, one of our songs, Blessed Be Your Name, when the sun's shining down on me, blessed are you, Lord, because I know your words. On the road marked with suffering, blessed are you, Lord, because I know your word. I know that you're good. I know that you're true. Even in the desert, even under testing, Jesus knew that God was good because he knew scripture. And so then finally, what we get after Jesus emerges from the desert, what do we get when uh, God's people emerge from the desert? We got the Ten Commandments, didn't we? The rules for them to live by. And so now, as Jesus emerges from the desert, we get some more teaching, some more rules to live by. And this time, this is about Jesus' rule and reign. This is about Jesus being the Messiah, the King, the one who they've been waiting for. And so, I went to Hobby Craft to find a silvery piece of paper, and this is all they could all they could give me. So I had to improvise and use tin foil. <laughs> yeah, that was James. <laughs> Most of the good ideas. <laughs> so what we get here in Matthew five, what we heard Elias and Venus read to us, are the beatitudes, the beautiful attitudes. They are the teaching, the, the, the rules, if you like, that are going to turn this world upside down. They're going to bring about God's rule and reign in this world. 
So shall we get stuck in? I hope that that's just helpful to go through the colours um, and just to remember and to remind us again, really, of the symmetry that there is in Scripture. All through the Bible, we can find these patterns. It's not just a random collection of books and letters and things that people thought might all just kind of fit together. There's been an amazing work of the Holy Spirit bringing together the story of God's people through thousands and thousands of years to show us who God is and who he's calling us to be. So what are these teachings all about? What are the Beatitudes all about? Well, I wonder if you can imagine the scene with me. It's a beautiful hillside. Maybe there are some kind of meadow flowers, the sunshine on your face. You can hear the sound of uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee just lapping along the shore. And you are sitting at the feet of Jesus. How cool is that? I wonder if you ever had thought you'd like to hear Jesus yourself. Would you like to be face to face with him? Imagine now hearing Jesus, just you um, and him, captivated. There are other people around, but he's captivating. This, these things that he's saying are so interesting to you. Your ears are open, your mind is stimulated. This is amazing stuff, listening to Jesus. And this teaching that Jesus brings us now that we read in Matthew 5 has shaped our Western laws and ethics for thousands and thousands of years, for 2,000 years. Nobody has come up with anything better than this. Isn't that cool? That Jesus is the one who has shaped our law and our ethics for thousands of years. Must hold on to all that he is saying, that he is telling us. And so Jesus uses this word over and over again, doesn't he? Blessed. What does it mean for us to be blessed? Well, I think a good translation of it, and the message kind of hints at this, what Venus and Elias read to us, blessed could, could be to say, happy are those. Blessed, happy are those. The beautiful attitudes, the, the ways that of understanding and living are different from what our, our world understands. But to live well as a human being, this is going to be countercultural. It's, it was weird then, and it's weird now. It's going to turn our world upside down. But Jesus says, happy are those who live like this. So, blessed are the pure in spirit, are the poor in spirit, sorry. And that's funny, isn't it? Because we think today that it's the rich who are happy. It's the rich who are blessed. After all, they have all the money they can want, they've got all the stuff that they need, they've got cool cars and big houses, and they can go on any holiday they want. Surely, the rich are the people who are happy, who are blessed. Jesus says, no. Happy are those who feel poor. When you feel like you don't have enough, when you're running low, then you'll find God's blessing when you reach out to him. As you rely on him, as you put your trust in God, that is when you will be happiest. That is true happiness. We are spiritually rich when we live with God as our friend and our saviour. That, that is richness. <coughs> so next, blessed are the peacemakers. I love that man that just put in that twist, not the peacekeepers, but the peacemakers. That's so good, isn't it? Keeps us on our toes. Not just the people who keep the peace and keep everyone quiet and down and behaving. People who make for peace, who bring others together, who prioritise forgiveness and reconciliation, help us to talk to each other, to understand what's important to each other, to be honest, but to come together, to make for peace. 
and in our uh, in our scene with Jesus teaching um, on the Mount of Beatitude, the um, Sea of Galilee behind. It, it's a place um, that lands that Jesus is teaching from has been so devastated by war and conflict, hasn't it? Even now, as we look at the news, um, there's, there's great conflict in that land. And yet from that place, Jesus calls for unity. He calls for peace. He calls us to listen and care for one another. That is what it means, Jesus says, to be part of God's family. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be sons and daughters of God. If we want to be part of God's family, then we should be people who make for peace, for unity, who listen and who care for one another. Jesus says later in the Gospel, we've been uh, reading John's Gospel um, in our morning prayers here on uh, Monday through to Wednesday. If you'd ever like to come and join us at morning prayer, you're really welcome. We read in John chapter 30, verse 35, Jesus says, By this, people will know that you're my disciples because you love one another. That's how people will know that you are part of my family, because you love one another. And perhaps this is why they're called the be attitudes, because Jesus is telling us the, the things he wants us to be. He wants us to be peacemakers, not the me attitudes, where it's all about us, but it's about others building God's family in this world. Okay, some more. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's a big word, isn't it? Righteousness. What does that even mean? Righteousness is to say those who want to live God's way, the right way. Blessed are those who want fairness, who work hard for the world to be kind and safe, where whoever you are, you can experience kindness and safety and fairness. You can be who God has made you to be. And blessed are you even if you get in trouble for doing the right thing. Another one, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now some of our young people might not know that last week I asked the adults to do a test. Who would be in favour of the adults doing a test? Yeah? Yeah? Give a couple of answers from the teenagers. Okay. Well, this wasn't a test that you could pass or fail. This was just a, um, this was like taking the car to the garage where you have to run some tests to see uh, whether everything's working properly, uh, whether the engine's functioning properly, whether the lights are all skew whip or whether their direction is right. I asked the adults to um, go home and have a think this week about whether they have, were fixing their eyes on Jesus. Were they watching and praying and worshipping? Were they living the right way? Were they hungering and thirst, thirsting for righteousness? There are so many things in our world, aren't there, that will clutter our vision, that will crowd out the good things that God tells us in his words. That pull our hearts and minds in all kinds of different directions. But Jesus says, those who will see God are those who keep their eyes fixed on him. Those who will see God, will see God move, will see him at work in, in our world today, are those who keep their eyes fixed on him. They keep praying. They keep watching, they keep worshipping, they keep making for peace. Their eyes fixed on him. And so just a gentle reminder then to the adults to, to go and spend some time this week doing that spiritual MOT, go through the different bits of the car and think about how your life is with God. That was last week, so I hope you'll touch on it a little bit so you go through the next couple of weeks. So why are these important? Why are these beautiful attitudes 
important to us and coming to the end. God wants to transform our human story. He wants to change our lives and those of the lives around us. He wants to change the lives of people who live here in Sand Hill. And in our world, people think that blessing and happiness is about power, is about long life, is about strength, is about wealth, is about victory. But Jesus is offering us a totally different way, an upside down way of living, of seeing the world, where the humble and the poor and the peacemakers, who are often looked down on and kind of uh, ignored, are the ones that God will honour. God turns our world totally upside down. God wants to bring his rule and his reign of peace and joy and holiness to our world today. And one day, scripture tells us that he will come back and he will establish his kingdom forever. Evil and death will be wiped away. Sadness and pain will be gone. Our experience of them will be no more. One day Jesus will come back and establish this upside down kingdom. One day this will be the way that the world works. How amazing is that? How cool is that? Isn't that a reason to, to be encouraged? <laughs> Even just to live this way. Because one day Jesus will come and this will be the way things work. In the meantime, while we're waiting for that, Jesus says that we can start living that way now. We can start living like God's kingdom is already here. We can show, uh, we can be a sign of what is coming. <coughs> Jesus says you can show what my kingdom is like by living this way now. Being part of my family living these beautiful attitudes, these be attitudes every day, a sign that my kingdom is coming, something better is coming. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you show us what is good my passage again, that you have shown us what is good, Jesus. To live by your way, with your rules, this upside down kingdom, it feels so different to us, God, than what we see in the world today. But we trust you that this is the right way to live. And so we pray today and this week that you help us to live these beautiful attitudes to be people who make for peace, to be those who belong to your family and invite others in, to be those who are devoted to your words and draw close to your heart every day. We long to see your kingdom come. We pray that you would help us to be those who watch and wait and also work for your goodness in this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Oh,